This episode contains discussion of racism and child murder. Listener discretion is advised. On Sunday, June 5th, 1983, Bill Hughes drove the short distance from his home to the home of Peggy and Doug Ryan. Bill's son, 11-year-old Chris, had a sleepover that night with the Ryan's son, Josh. There was no answer at the front door and the Ryan's car was missing. When he peeked in through a sliding glass door in the back of the home, Bill thought that he was seeing some sort of prank, but unfortunately, it wasn't. Inside the home, there were bodies of Doug, Peggy, and Jessica Ryan, and Bill's son, Chris. Josh Ryan, the youngest boy, had somehow survived what turned out to be a brutal massacre. Several months later, despite many lingering questions about the murders, a man was charged and ultimately sentenced to death. Was Kevin Cooper guilty of a quadruple homicide, or had he been framed? Welcome back to Killer Queens. This is a heavy hitter. They all are. Yeah, it is. You know, they all are. But um, this is a particularly uh, gruesome murder. So we'll let you know before we talk about injuries, just so you can be aware of that. Um, We do want to give a Hey Girl thanks to Madison for writing our script for this today. And thanks to Beth. And there were other listeners who requested this case, but they didn't want us to shout them out. So thanks to Beth and friends. It was an anonymous tip. (gasps) (laughs) Yes, sounds great. Um, There also is, okay, so in every single episode, we list our sources on our website. So just so you know, you can always find that. Um, there was a book written about this case, uh, by crime magazine editor, J. Patrick O'Connor. We've taken some information from that. Um, we've also taken information from like the op-ed in the New York times and some other places. So if you want to get access to any of those sources, just click the little links in our website. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's get going. All right, so let's talk about the Ryans first. Uh, Peggy Ann Howell grew up in Pennsylvania with her mother. She loved animals, particularly horses, and she spent most of her childhood training horses and she would enter them into competitions. She was an actual horse girl. That feels like shots fired. I know what you're doing here. I don't appreciate it. Okay, yeah, maybe I didn't have a horse and maybe I didn't ride horses very much, but I had a lot of grand champions. I love my little pony and you can blow it out your ass. All right. All right. Well, there you have it. Just saying Peggy, she was a horse girl. That's all I said. I didn't say anything else. (laughs) You're taking offense to to something, then that's on you. You are gaslighting the (laughs) shit out of me right now and I don't appreciate it, but continue. Tori was a horse girl too. Quit with the air quotes. Come on. She loved horses. Whatever. Okay. Um, So Peggy wanted to be a veterinarian when she was young, but her mother convinced her to follow in her footsteps, which was chiropractic care. So she ended up graduating from the Palmer School of Chiropractic in Davenport, Iowa in 1963, just like her mother, Dr. Mary Howell, had done. And she ended up joining her mom's private practice office in Santa Ana, California. And then she opened her own clinic several years later. When Peggy attended a college reunion in 1970, she met a young man named Franklin Douglas Ryan. He went by Doug. Doug was a former Marine who was near graduation at the school. And Doug had been previously married, but he was now separated. And unlike Peggy, um, who grew up in sunny California, Doug was from the Midwest. Peggy and Doug quickly grew close. They started dating. Um, Two months after Doug's divorce was final, on December 20th, 1970, Doug and Peggy got married. So Doug ended up joining his wife at her chiropractic clinic, um, but they decided to sell it when Peggy got pregnant. And they used the proceeds to fund their move to Olympia, Washington, where they opened another clinic. Peggy was finally able to purchase some horses of her own at this point, so she bought two beautiful Arabian horses. On November 9th, 1972, Peggy gave birth to the Ryan's first child, a daughter named Jessica Kate Ryan. Um, now, unfortunately, I mean, raising horses, buying horses, that's expensive. Like, yeah, it's expensive. The upkeep and all that kind of stuff, the maintenance, it's just yeah, crazy. It costs a lot of money. Um, 
So they had two horses and that expense is growing. They also have a new baby. Um, and Peggy's not working as much as she was before. So Doug's kind of carrying the patient load here. Um, and this, this practice just was not thriving. It was not a successful practice. They were having trouble making the money that they needed to make ends meet. And they finally decided, let's just move back to Santa Ana. We can rejoin Peggy's mom's practice, both of us. It's already thriving. It was very, very successful. Um, so that's what they did. They went back there in 1973. And Peggy's mom, Mary, even gave the family a loan to help them purchase a home with a backyard large enough for their horses. Except she doesn't just have the two anymore. Now she has five. And one of them's pregnant. Oh, how cute. It's a lot of horses for a backyard. Lots and lots of horses. I mean, this is not a farm. It's a it's a house with a sizable yard, I would say, comparatively. But it's not like got stables on it or whatever. Right. Yeah. So while Peggy, Doug, and Jessica loved their home in their backyard, their neighbors didn't love it quite as much. Um, they complained about the Ryan family raising the horses in the backyard. Um, I mean, that is a lot of horses. I don't know. I wonder, is it the smell? Or Like, we lived next to a pasture that had horses and it didn't bother us any, but um, I don't know what their problem was with it, but they just did not like it. And they were like, I don't want horses in my backyard. No horses on my watch. Not on my watch. Clear. No horses, no horses. Like, take it. Like, the, what a cause. I, we don't want you to have horses. Mommy dear is like, no horses ever. <laughs> yeah. Like, I could see there was somebody who lived around here who had orangutans in their backyard. And one of them hopped the fence and attacked a woman and chewed her leg almost completely off. So I think that's bad. That's bad. Um, I could see something noisy like a flock of peacocks. They're very noisy. They make all those like... Yeah, like they do that a lot. Beautiful noise. Yeah. Yeah. Goats. They always get out. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm And they'll leave little turds all over your yard. Yeah. And eat up all your grass. Yeah. I don't know what the deal is with horses, really. But whatever it was, they didn't like it. They were not horse girls. They were not horse girls. So, um, Mary, always ready to chip in and help out, right? She bought a four-bedroom house in Chino Hills about 30 minutes away, and they moved the horses to her house. So this was a larger property. Um, meanwhile, the Ryans are like, well, let's find our own ranch home so that we'll have enough space for our horses where we are. Um, so they, um, are doing the search, you know, and this is in the seventies. Like I just, I'm always in awe of like, if I needed to look for a house, I would go on mine. How do you do this? I guess in the newspaper and then you have to drive to it. It's incredible. The amount of work you have to used to do to just go look at a house. Right. Or I guess get a realtor and. I mean, now all the pictures are in the website. Yeah. Yeah. Just crazy. Um, mm -hmm. So they're doing all that. And Peggy was pregnant again at this point, And she and Doug were excited for their first son. Additionally, several of Peggy's horses were pregnant. So she was ready to train these horses. She wanted to start competing, breeding them, like all of these things. And in a letter to a family member, she wrote, quote, right now we are horse poor. But give us five years of our planned breeding program and we'll have only the best. It's so exciting. Finally, after all these years of wanting, I've got what I've always wanted. That is sweet. And it's also very sad. It is very know. sad. Yeah. So not long after Mary moved to Chino Hills, the Ryan family found a house just up the hill from Mary's. It had come on the market. It was five acres with a barn and a riding ring. How perfect is that? Bingo bongo, right? And um, now the house was like not in the best condition you would say but they were like we can fix it up it's fine like it has everything that we need it's got good she's got good bones and that what they say about houses yeah they do in fact say that you know they can make it what they need to make it in 1975 peggy doug jessica and baby joshua moved into the farmhouse into a neighborhood populated with several other arabian horse breeders on old english road what 
there was not a community better made for this family. Mm -mm. I mean, like, come on. So this is a tight-knit group of horse breeders referred to um, as Arabian Horse Center of South California. I think, you know, self-named, but it is apt, I think. (laughs) And just like her mother, Jessica grew up around horses, so she loved riding. She loved helping her mom take care of them. She, too, was a horse girl. An actual horse girl. I knew you were going to... Keep going. I also, I also love that Madison like wrote that in because like everybody knows that you're, you know, you were a horse girl or whatever. You loved horses, so it's just funny that like she knew to put that in there. <laughs> yeah, but you made it your own, really. Um, with the she actually, they were actual horse girls. I mean, you did ask for horses. It's not for lack of trying on your part. I wanted horses. Yeah. I know we had some land. Yeah, at least one. I mean, come on. I wanted horses. I think we could have fit one horse on there. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I took care of my grand champions. They're the most beautiful horses in the world. But sure. I made them stables out of the clamshell Disney movie boxes. Like, I took care of them. I brushed them. You asking for horses made a lot more sense than me asking for a dolphin to put in that field. I, I really felt like we could build a tank. <laughs> I mean... Because the field is large enough for the dolphin to have room to swim. Sure. Where do you get a dolphin? At the dolphin store? Yes. And that's where you also buy your dolphin tank. Of course. (laughs) I was like, Dad, there's plenty of room in this field for a (laughs) big-ass tank for the dolphin. I don't see what the problem is. Yeah, what else do you need? Yeah, just get a pool. Look at the size of it. Exactly. Get a big old pool. It's fine. Yeah. I bet he was like, you show your kid Free Willy once. That was a mistake. And then, or Flipper even too. Mm-hmm. Flipper was a good movie though. Um, So, I mean, things were going really well. Like, they've settled into this community in Chino Hills. Um, They loved the area they were in. They loved their neighbors. They were super happy to finally be breeding horses. And, I mean, Doug seemed to, like, be all in it with Peggy. Like, it was like they were finally where they wanted to be. I also wanted to just say really quickly, I remember this case because a long, long, long time ago. In a galaxy far, far away. Exactly. A few years ago, for sure. I listened to, I used to listen to True Crime Garage like every week. And just now that we do this for a living, I don't listen to stuff as much. But I I had always remembered there was one. And, you know, a lot of people say the captain says stupid stuff or whatever. Um, but there was one episode where they were talking about people who had horses and that they moved into a community of horse people. And so I remember the captain going, I believe they prefer to be called centaurs. And I thought that was so funny. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and of course, Nick just breezed on past it and moved on. Oh, but that makes me sad for the for the captain. I know. But then I started, like, when we started reading up on this case, I was like, that's the one. This has to be the one because they moved into a community <laughs> of other horse people. So I'm yeah, pretty sure it's the case. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh, my gosh. That's hysterical. I love that. It makes me sad, though, when people are really funny and then other people don't appreciate them in their own yeah. time. I mean, it, it's possibly an editing thing, too. But anyway, I thought it was funny. True. But still. But still. But still. Yeah. Um, they left in the hilarious joke. Um, But anyway. On Saturday, June 4th, 1983, 41-year-old Peggy, 41-year-old Doug, 10-year-old Jessica, 8-year-old Josh, and Josh's friend, 11-year-old Christopher Hughes, went to a potluck in the Ryan's neighborhood. This was not your average potluck, my gosh. There were about 100 other neighbors there. This was like a block party or, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's a thing, yeah. It's pretty incredible. It's huge. But, okay, so most of them were the fellow horse people Center. and yes <laughs> everyone gathered at the home of george and valerie blade and they brought food and drinks to share and chris actually got permission from his parents to spend the night at the ryan's home after the party so the blade son jason had asked if he could go to the sleepover too but his parents said no because his grandmother was visiting which hindsight holy right? moly that has to be something that they're the most thankful for in their entire lives like Man, how could, yeah, how could you know, but it's like, Wars, you know. Yeah. My God, that was close. Jesus took the wheel on that one, I guess, but 
Around 9.30 p.m., the Ryans and Chris returned to the family's home, and the boys fell asleep in their sleeping bags on the floor in Josh's room. That is so precious. I remember, it's like, you don't, I mean, you could pile up in the bed, I'm sure, but it's more fun if it's like, you know, you sleep, sleep on the floor on a pallet yeah. and stuff. Yeah, it's cute. Sweet. Jessica slept in her own bed, and Doug watched some TV before he joined Peggy in the master bedroom. So nothing, of course, like we always hear, nothing seemed out of the ordinary as the family went to bed. Everything was normal. Early the next morning, which is Sunday, June 5th, Marianne Hughes called the Ryan household when their son, Chris, hadn't returned home yet. He was supposed to be home at 9 a.m. to attend church service with his family. Mrs. Hughes called several times, but each time she got a busy signal. And she was thinking that maybe the Ryans and Chris went to breakfast or they ran an errand. And so she just waited for her son to return and he didn't. At 11 a.m., Mrs. Hughes drove to the Ryan's nearby home and knocked on the front door, but she didn't get an answer. The door was locked, so she walked around the house and tried to peer in the windows of Jessica and Josh's bedrooms, but she couldn't see anything. She yelled out for the family and for Chris, but nobody responded, and she didn't hear anything coming from inside the house. Also, the family station wagon was not at the home. It went in the driveway, and so she, again, was like, okay, maybe they went out and they were still out. She drove home and she asked her husband to go to the Ryan's home to see if he could figure out what was going on because something was not sitting right with her about this, right? So Bill drives up the road to the house and again, there's no answer at the front door. So he walks around the house and he goes to a sliding glass door that led to the master bedroom. What he saw when he looked in this sliding glass door Mm. made his stomach drop. He at first thought it was just a prank, like, you know, somebody had paint and makeup on, but really it was a horrific scene of a bloody massacre. Through the glass door, Mr. Hughes could see Peggy laying in the middle of the room. She was nude and covered in blood. Her husband was kneeling by the edge of the bed. He was also nude and also covered in blood. Just past Peggy, Mr. Hughes saw his son laying on his stomach. He wasn't moving. Josh, also covered in blood, was curled up in the fetal position by his friend. And Josh was the only one who appeared to be moving, but his eyes were vacant and he had cuts all over his face. Mr. Hughes tried to pull the sliding glass door open, but he couldn't. So the it's crazy. And of course, when you're in that moment of panic, I can't even imagine what that feels like. But you're not thinking clearly. You're not doing things logically. So he's trying to open the sliding glass door, but it was unlocked. He thought it was it was locked, but it was unlocked, but he was pulling it in the wrong direction. So... He starts yelling for Josh to open the door so he could help, but Josh couldn't move. Mr. Hughes ran around the side of the house to the kitchen door and kicked it in. Um, This is, it's so sad that just a few feet away, there's this awful bloody scene, but in the kitchen, playing on the floor is the two, family's two dogs and three kittens. They're just playing. Ugh. So, Mr. Hughes goes straight to the master bedroom, and in the doorway leading to the bedroom, he found Jessica. Like the rest of the family, she was covered in blood and lacerations. Mr. Hughes reached down to try to help her, but once he touched her, he knew she was beyond help. Rigor mortis had already set in. As he stepped over her and into the bedroom, he called out to Josh and asked him what happened, and Josh tried to speak, but he just could not speak. Mr. Hughes moved to his son to find similar findings to Jessica. Chris was bloodied. He had significant facial and head injuries, along with rigor mortis. He found that both Peggy and Doug were also beyond help. Mr. Hughes tried to call 911 from the Ryan's landline phone, but it wasn't working. He ran next door to have a neighbor call 911, and Mr. Hughes, in a terrible state of shock, he left the neighbor um, left the neighbor to wait for the police while he drove home to tell his wife what happened. Mm. Several paramedics and firefighters arrived on scene at 12:30 p.m. Peggy, Doug, Jessica Ryan, and Chris Hughes were pronounced dead on the scene. Paramedics went on to do everything they could for eight-year-old Josh, and Josh was in a significant state of shock as well after so much blood loss. His throat had been slit from ear to ear, which is why he could not speak. It is always so... I don't know the right word. I want to say appalling, but that sounds negative. Like, it's it's amazing that someone can survive. A- yes. An injury like that. Yeah. It's just beyond words. Yep. So he had a large wound to his head, multiple stab wounds to the back, as well as large lacerations across the rest of his face, chest, and head. Josh reportedly had kept his fingers pressed on his throat to stop the bleeding. The wherewithal to do that. He's eight years old. 
eight years old. I guess it's like that fight or flight yeah feeling in you where you're like you just yes you just have you know your body knows what to do uh, ish you know yeah i know so despite all of these catastrophic injuries josh was still able to hold up eight fingers when the paramedics asked him how old he was after initial attempts to stabilize josh the paramedics loaded him onto a medical helicopter where he was airlifted to the local hospital and he arrived at the hospital at 1 36 p.m As the surgeons began to assess and treat Josh, they found that the stab wounds to his back had fractured three of his ribs and punctured a lung. The wound to his head had fractured his skull and his ear was nearly severed. He also had a fractured collarbone. He was sedated and intubated while surgeons treated his injuries and stabilized him. Oh my gosh. So Mary, Josh's grandmother, sat by his side at Loma Linda University Hospital waiting for her grandson to wake up. And Josh was of course, absolutely devastated to learn that his mother, father, sister, and his best friend were all dead. Mary even said that Josh told her that he wished he had died too so he could be with them. No. Eight years old, baby. Police wasted no time in talking to Josh to see if he could help them figure out what happened that night. A clinical social worker by the name of Donald Gamondoy Uh, interviewed Josh on the same afternoon that he was brought into the hospital, and he used a chart of words and numbers and asked Josh to point to his answers, because again, he can't speak. And he asked the young boy how many people were there, and Josh pointed to the number three. Um, He also asked, were they male? Josh pointed to yes. Um, Josh pointed to the word no when he asked if the intruders were black. He pointed to yes when asked if the men were white. And Gamondoy also said that Josh was able to communicate that he had seen the men before. San Bernardino County Sheriff's Deputy Urban Dale Sharp later testified that he also interviewed Josh on the day that he was brought into the emergency room. Sharp said that he'd actually interviewed him twice that day. Josh answered his questions by squeezing the deputy's hands for yes and not squeezing for a no. During the first interview, he indicated that there were three white men in the house during the attack, but that he didn't know them. However, Sharp said that during the second interview an hour later, Josh said that the three men were Hispanic and that they attacked the family between 4 and 5 a.m. that morning. He added that Josh said that the three Hispanic males were between 18 and 20 years old, possibly driving a Chevy Impala, and had been at the Ryan's house on June the 4th. What is incredible to me is that an eight-year-old can recall after everything that he has been through all of these details down to the car that they drove yeah i'm wondering how he saw the car well if i'm guessing well because he says they were there the day before that's what i was thinking yeah yeah it seemed like a given that there were multiple perpetrators responsible for the massacre and the coroner's initial determination was that there had been several assailants and that three different weapons had been used to inflict the wounds they determined a hatchet an ice pick and a knife had all been responsible for the wounds doug had a total of 37 wounds most of them on his chest upper extremities and head Peggy had 33 wounds, uh, most on her upper abdomen, head, and face. Jessica had the most wounds by far, a total of 46. She had a large amount of wounds to the right arm and her head as well as her chest. Chris suffered from 26 wounds and multiple skull fractures. The injuries were catastrophic and all of the victims bled out quickly. The same day as the family had been discovered, a neighbor found a bloody hatchet down the road from the Ryan house. And the Ryan station wagon is also missing, remember, it wasn't in the driveway. There, at this time, was limited forensic testing available, and there reportedly wasn't much evidence found at the scene that could be tested. A neighbor had told police that they'd seen three men driving to and from the Ryan's home on Saturday afternoon. Weirdly enough, there were multiple loaded weapons in the Ryan's master bedroom that had never been touched. Which I I think says... This was a blitz attack. 100%. Yeah, I think it was, they were surprised by what was happening, you know? It wasn't like they heard them break in or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't even have time to get it. And there were multiple people in the house that were attacked, five people attacked. 
that seems very difficult for one person to do with three no, weapons. I don't. 100 percent absolutely um i am wondering this might be neither here nor there i don't know but peggy and doug were both nude Mm -hmm. but nobody talks about the possibility of like a sexual assault was it possibly because they slept in the nude or maybe yeah could that be it I i know i don't know i don't know if they made them get undressed or yeah if they just happen to sleep in the buff yeah i don't know i i just i found it kind of interesting that nowhere in the research that i've done has anybody been like given an explanation for that because a lot of times when you hear about a murder and someone has been found nude there is some sort of sinister reason behind that so yeah yeah i haven't seen anything either yeah i looked through like a lot of court documents and it's just stated they were nude, but nothing else. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just wondering. Okay, so investigators began looking for three men who'd recently escaped from the nearby California Institution for Men. The three prisoners were Alboro Nori, Michael Martinez, and David Troutman. While there was no specific evidence linking these men to the murders, it seemed like a worthwhile avenue for police to investigate. They'd also searched a vacant house that was just about 125 yards from the Ryan house. The house was used as a rental home, but was unoccupied at the time. The San Bernardino County Sheriff Floyd Tidwell said that the inside of the vacant home, they found clothing, blood, and other evidence to indicate that the person who'd been squatting there was involved with the Ryan's murders. On Monday, June 6th, the day after the Ryan's were found, Alboro Nori, one of the escaped convicts, was located 40 miles from Chino Hills and ultimately cleared of any involvement. Just after this, Sheriff Tidwell held a news conference stating that the murders happened one right after the other and that there was more than one person behind the murders. On Tuesday, June 7th, that's important to remember that little tidbit of there, he thinks that there were definitely more than one person, but The coroner says that, the witness, the only surviving witness says that, and now we've released that information in a press conference. Absolutely. On Tuesday, June 7th, the prints found at the vacant home were matched to a convicted burglar named Kevin Cooper. Another of the escaped convicts, Michael Martinez, was located and cleared of any involvement. A warrant was issued for the arrest of 25-year-old Kevin Cooper, but they also determined that David Troutman, the third escaped convict, was actually Kevin Cooper. Cooper had stolen identification from David Troutman and had been imprisoned under that name. Could you imagine being the actual David Troutman and... Hearing on the news that you're, like, wanted. Yeah. You're like, oh, excuse me? No, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I was playing bingo that night. Absolutely. I had my bridge club. I was, I was playing pickup sticks. Come on. Kick the can. Yeah. Kick the can. What a fun game. I've never played it, actually. I don't I've know what it is. I've never played it either, but I could get do just down kick on just a kicking can? a can. Yeah, sure. I sure, guess. yeah. All right. I enjoy kicking. Yes. <laughs> yes we Yours all do us too yeah yes <laughs> well, too much some of us yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> on june 9th cooper was charged with four counts of murder and one count of attempted murder uh, and a warrant was issued for his arrest it's just what happened yeah i feel like we're missing so many steps but we're not they're like we found prints of this person in the vacant house boom arrested he's murdered them all Mm-hmm. Nothing connecting it yet, just because it was in Which... it was in an, an abandoned house anyway, or like unavailable, or not unavailable, un uh, inhabited. So like, yes, yeah, so people did squat there. Like, I don't know. It's yeah. just interesting. They're like, well, yeah. And I think this is a golden opportunity to point out that just because you break a law by squatting in a house that's not yours, that's B and E breaking and entering. I get that doesn't mean that you killed somebody. It just doesn't mean that. Also, what really shrinks my hat is the fact that the police, they don't have to give any reason for why they're arresting him and charging him for all these charges, right? For right. murder and all this stuff. He has to give them all kinds of reasons and evidence as to why he should not be charged. Yeah. But then what, what do they say next? So they arrest him. And charge him with all these murders, and then what? And then Sheriff Tidwell is like, Cooper is the only suspect. 
One person did this, guys. We have changed. We didn't say that earlier, though. That was... That, I didn't say it. No. You might... Didn't happen. Think you heard me say that, but you heard me right. wrong. Well, and sometimes it's hard. Numbers are hard. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. I understand that. Oh, sure. um, and sometimes when you think you hear three suspects, what you really heard was one suspect. No S. Lone intruder. Yep. Right. Or maybe he's going Baguan and he's like, there's one suspect. That's what it was. Baguan did the did the press conference for him. He was like, well, the problem is, Baguan, I was unavailable at the time of the press conference. I called up old Baguan and said, hey, man, can you do this press conference for me? You know, he adds an S on to everything. <laughs> that way, it's Not like, my fault. well, you heard it wrong, okay? Take it up with Baguan. Because it it's with one Baguan. person. Yep. Also, um, shortly after the murders, the Ryan's missing station wagon was found in a Long Beach parking lot. Mm -hmm. Again, pretty importante. So, in the search for Cooper, police found that a hotel manager in Tijuana recalled that Cooper checked in around 4 p.m. on June 5th and checked out on the 8th. The hotel was about 130 miles south of Chino Hills. So, there's a manhunt for Cooper, right? Investigators learned that Cooper had escaped from... The minimum secure or a minimum security prison on June 2nd. He had been in prison for two residential burglaries, and the year prior, he'd been in Pennsylvania where he'd been suspected of a rape of a young girl who had been at home at a home that he was burglarizing. A few days after the murders, Cooper made friends with a couple in Mexico and went on a boat trip with them up the coast of California. And then several weeks later, Cooper was arrested at Santa Barbara or by Santa Barbara police after being accused of attempted rape at knife point on a boat. Several items were found on the boat that had been taken from the vacant home near the Ryans. Inside the vacant home, investigators found a sheath from a bloody hatchet along with a strap from one of several knives that were missing from the home. There was also an ice pick found to be missing, and there was a button from a prison jacket that was the same as what Cooper was wearing when he escaped prison, but there are conflicting reports that said that Cooper was actually wearing a different colored uniform. Yeah, I read that the button in the court documents that this judge, uh, Judge Fletcher, when he did his whole big thing, I don't know what you would call it, but um, he said the button that was found was green and that Cooper was wearing a tan or beige colored jacket, that they were two different color buttons. All right. Um... There were shoe prints found in both the vacant home and the Ryan's home that matched the shoes that were issued to inmates, and they were also the same size as Cooper's. Remember that. There was an initial search of the Ryan station wagon where blood was found on three of the car seats. A second search revealed two cigarette butts that contained Cooper's DNA. Remember that. Yeah. A second search. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't find these cigarette butts the first time around. Not that they didn't realize they had Cooper's DNA on it the first time around. They did not find them the first time around. Right. And I'm there. pretty sure when the police are doing, conducting a search like this, they're not just giving it the old Tory ocular pat down where you're like, looked everywhere. Looked everywhere. Yeah. No, they're going, they're thorough in their search. So they should have found these cigarette butts. But lo and behold, the second search, they're like, woohoo! How did I miss these I don't, things? Right. Exactly. But anyway, the tobacco found in the vehicle was reported to be exclusively issued to inmates. Yeah. Upon, and I also, yeah. the terminology that they used with this tobacco, because Kevin Cooper did use tobacco. Um, I don't think anybody's, well, and I don't want to, I'm having trouble saying what I want to say right now and not giving away what we want to say later, but I don't think that Kevin Cooper is denying that the cigarette butts were his. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He's not like, I'm not a smoker and I would have never, you know. Yeah. I don't think that that's the issue. It's like, how the hell do they get there? Right. And they also said that the tobacco that they found was consistent with the type of tobacco that Kevin Cooper said that he used. I don't trust not one single time when somebody says consistent with. No. So so some scientist opened up a rolling paper or whatever and was like, okay. And then they opened up the one in the car and they're like, <laughs> looks the same to me. <laughs> yeah. Done. That's all they have. Like, it's consistent with. It looks similar to. I am not a cigarette smoker. 
but I don't know. It all looks the same to these old eyes. I don't... uh, How do you... (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure somebody out there is going to be like, you friggin' idiot. There are so many different kinds of tobacco, but unless it's like... I'm sure there are, but to say the, the operative word to me is consistent with or the operative phrase. So you're not telling me it's an exact scientific match. It's an exact chemical, molecular, whatever match to the exact makeup of the type of tobacco that Kevin Cooper admits to using. You're saying they look similar. Well, and that's how we've talked about it till we're blue in the face, but I'm going to keep on. Um, Using phrases like consistent with, would you have, would it have the same weight if somebody said they look similar? Look similar. Right. Same exactly. thing. When you hear the term consistent with in a courtroom, we have talked about this, like you said, till we're blue in the face. You and I both were this way. We believed that when a prosecutor or um, the medical examiner or who the pathologist, whoever it is, said this thing, th- this hair is consistent with the defendant's hair. I heard it's a match. I believed mm-hmm. that that was synonymous with this is a match. That's not what that means. It means literally they look similar. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that is the same thing as saying like we found a blonde hair, okay? And she has blonde hair. Well, they look mm-hmm. similar. They're consistent with. But if you like you said, would it have the same weight? If you're in front of a jury and you say, "Well, there was a blonde hair found at the scene and the defendant has blonde hair, so you tell me." Yeah. What are the odds? Okay, well, how many people have blonde hair? Yeah. That doesn't, I mean, and that doesn't have a lot of weight. But when you say mm-hmm. that a scientist says it's consistent with, the jury hears it's a match. 100%. It just, it really, really, I don't, it just, it, it burns my cornbread is what it does. It just, you know. Totally. It's what it does. But. Let's continue. So, upon Cooper's arrest, he admitted to having stayed in the vacant home. And again, this is the thing about Kevin Cooper. I don't think that he is free from any charges. I'm not saying that he was a a perfectly law-abiding citizen citizen that, yeah, that just got plucked up and was like, wow, look at all these things he did. He's admitting, yeah, I did go into the house, but I didn't, I didn't murder those people. And just because you committed burglary or breaking and entering does not mean that you're a murderer but anyway and we don't have we have him we have evidence that he stayed in this vacant home near the ryan's home yeah we don't have any evidence that he ever entered foot in the ryan's home no that's very important but the police are just saying well because he was close to the home it had to have been him here and to further that and make people believe it they magically have found these cigarette butts in the car, which we'll get to that later. But anyway, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm trying real hard not to, but I want to, but I can't. Yeah. So anyway, in the Ryan's home, there was a massive amount of blood across the floors and the walls. Crime scene investigators found a drop of blood that matched Cooper's blood type, but it was too small to determine if it matched completely. Remember that. Remember that. And... Like we know, I'm sure, if you have been a true crime um, listener or watcher or whatever, the odds of me sharing the same blood type with someone, not that crazy. Not crazy at all. Right. Um, And I would wonder, is that blood type, does that match any of the other victims? Tiny little piece, tiny little drop. Mm-hmm. Did it match the victims? Yeah. But the reality is, yeah, it can match so many other people. And at that time, that's all they had. And I understand that. But totally. I'm not like crapping on them for not having the technology. But right. Yeah. But that's still not enough. That's still the same thing as consistent with. Mm -hmm. Because all you have is the blood type, which is like here on the funnel of, you know, getting specific in evidence. Blood type is up here. It's a match is way down here at the point. Well, we still have so many other things that can fit into that. Like, well, and also if you want to show me like so much concrete, 
I'll even take, I would even allow some very moving circumstantial evidence. I'll give them that. Other than just these these things, because if we had that plus these little things, I'd be like, yes, mm-hmm. I agree. Mm-hmm. But yeah. we don't got all that. And, you know, like the cigarette butts, which, again, we'll get into a little bit more later. But if you didn't find that on the first go round. It wasn't there. It wasn't there. They're not they're not tiny specks of something that would be easily missed. They're actual like things. I mean, I, I just like. Why is that admitted into court, but other things are not? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, on August 1st, 1983, Cooper was arraigned in San Bernardino County for the four murders and one attempted murder, and he pleaded not guilty. After moving it 100 miles to San Diego due to the amount of threats made against Cooper and the significant racial tension building in the community over the arrest, the trial of Kevin Cooper began in September of 1984. So... I guess we haven't mentioned this. We told you there would be some some racism involved in this case. Kevin Cooper is a black man. The Ryans and Christopher Hughes were white white people. Um, and as far as I can tell, most of the detectives, law enforcement, DA, I haven't seen photos of every single one of them, but... Um, Predominantly white. Yes just to add context to that. Um, The community was obviously very incredibly upset over the deaths of four people, including two children. Um, And you you can't fault the community for believing law enforcement when they say that they've done their due diligence in arresting this person and charging him. Like, if, if, I mean, again, that's one of those, like, this is what I thought about true crime before I started covering it. I, I thought, and most people do, that if the police are going to arrest somebody or the DA is going to charge somebody and take it to trial, then they've got some pretty good evidence on this person. Mm-hmm. And, and they, they actually believe that it. it's, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, so you can't fault the community for believing that he had something to do with it. And unfortunately, now we've got this black man who has a criminal history Mm -hmm. and he's facing charges, even though the police were like, it had to have been multiple suspects. It had to have been at least three people. At least three people. We have the eyewitness. So here's my question, because later they're going to say, well, because Josh's testimony is going to change. Initially, he says there was three, maybe four white men, possibly Hispanic. None of them were black. Um, that's going to change. It's going to become one person who was black. And. Or he says a shadow. Uh, it, it looked like a shadow. Yeah. So the police and the DA's response to that is, well, he was mistaken when we interviewed him the first two times. He was confused. Well, then why did you want to interview him at that time? If he if he was too confused to so a doctor would have had to have given the. Yes, he's coherent enough to answer questions. Okay. And it was a doctor who determined that he was lucid and coherent enough and aware enough. And they asked him other questions that they could verify answers to, like, how old are you? And things like that. Like, so. And also what this kind of questioning, and I'm not saying that Josh lied or I don't know, you know, I don't. I I don't think that he lied, but he might have been mistaken or something. It could have happened. I don't know. But what it feels like is that they're they're trying and trying and trying until they get the answer they want. Mm -hmm. Does that feel like that to you? Yeah, because the purpose of trying to ask witnesses questions as close to the incident as possible is to keep their memory as fresh as possible and all of those things. The idea is that you're going to get the most accurate answers closer to the event, right? Absolutely, but they're yeah. saying, not in this case, in this case, we got it's the, the inaccurate opposite. stuff in the beginning, and as time went on, it got more accurate, which is mm-hmm. which is the opposite of why the protocol is to ask questions as close to the incident as possible. Absolutely. So it just, you know, um, But 
you know, like you said, now they're saying, never mind, it's just one person. Um, they're now saying these murders were committed by Kevin Cooper and only Kevin Cooper. And detectives admitted that their evidence was circumstantial, but they felt that it was really strong. They said that Cooper had murdered the family in order to steal their vehicle and money. Go ahead and jot that down. Um, mm -hmm. The hatchet used in the murders had been stolen from the vacant home, prison issued tobacco that we talked about, and also shoe prints that matched the prison issued shoes. Prison issued is difficult to say together. Um, yeah. There were also matching shoe prints found in blood on a bed sheet in the Ryan's master bedroom outside of the house on a hot tub cover and in the dust in the vacant house. The small blood spot in the Ryan's hallway that matched Cooper's blood type. That's the only bit of blood. This is a very violent struggle. And if you look at pictures of this crime scene, it's completely covered in blood. It is horrific and they found one very tiny speck of blood mm -hmm. that supposedly matches kevin cooper and it's in the hallway and that's it and i mean do we have any defensive wounds on cooper no none that i'm aware of he wasn't just... found right away but right no just checking right um there were indications of blood in the shower and sink in the vacant home which was luminol testing and i don't think i realized this but judge fletcher said in his 141 page document that he presented to the courts about this said that luminol reacts with bleach in the same way that it does with human blood so you have to do a two-step test if it fluoresces then you do the next test to be sure that what you're what is fluorescing is human blood and not bleach or animal blood or whatever. Yeah. Well, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. But, I mean, for the amount that I'm sure they found in the, you know, mm -hmm. shower or whatever. Right. Um, it, That could be dependent because if it's if it's a significant amount of blood that they think that they're seeing, if there's a significant amount of whatever that's fluorescing, right, Um, what do you use to clean your shower and your, like, a lot especially of people, especially at that time. rental home people who are staying in a rental home they use bleach mm -hmm. and they said that the patterns that they found were not so say you're covered in blood and you're showering off or whatever you're gonna expect the the blood to kind of trickle down you know trickle down maybe pool around the drain but it's gonna be coming in a downward motion the what they found that fluoresced was like it was it was horizontal from side to side like a smear like a cleaning or whatever so and he and judge fletcher says in this um in this court document y you it there is always a two-step process when something fluoresces with luminol but this that second step was not done i uh, imagine that at all it just was not done why is that this Police investigation, so far, what I'm hearing and what I have learned from, you know, watching, listening, doing my own research, they did just enough to get the the results that they wanted. Yes. They did not do checks and balances. Mm -hmm. They did not, um, you know, give themselves an internal investigation, whatever you want to call it. They didn't check their homework. They just were like, boom. Yeah. We got it. Because three people escaped from this prison, and initially they say it looks like three people did it. So why did we clear the other two, and now we're just on Kevin Cooper? It just, yeah. you know, now everything has to fit that narrative. There was a tan t-shirt found down the street from the Ryan home that had several spots of blood on it, and the blood was determined to belong to two people. Doug Ryan and the second person was undetermined at the time, um, but the type did match Cooper's blood type. The San Bernardino County Chief Deputy District Attorney said of their case, quote, we had overwhelming evidence of his guilt. The footprints, the tobacco, the timing, the murder weapon, the missing car, overwhelming. 
Uh, Cooper did take the stand in his own defense. He again admitted that he had been hiding out in that vacant home, but adamantly denied anything to do with the murders. He said that when he arrived at the vacant home, he braided his hair, shaved his beard, and then made a few phone calls before heading to Mexico. And the phone calls are, they're not disputed. He made phone calls. He was calling friends of his to give him money, which they did not do. Um, but that is there. Josh Ryan, who was 10 years old at the time of the trial, did not testify in court, but a video was shown in court of him being asked questions while uh, with his grandmother. This was now a year and a half after the murders, and Josh was asked if he saw anyone in the house that night that didn't belong there. And he responded, you can't really tell at night because it could be anyone. I saw almost like a shadow or something. Josh no longer recalled seeing three white or possibly Hispanic men in his house, only one shadow. The detective who initially interviewed Josh said that he believed that Josh may have been confused and thinking of the three Hispanic men who'd stopped at the ranch earlier that day asking for work. The jury heard testimony from a total of 141 witnesses and were presented 788 pieces of evidence throughout the three months that the trial lasted. And on February 19, 1985, the jury returned with a verdict. Kevin Cooper was found guilty on four counts of first degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Less than a month later, on March 1st, it was determined that Cooper would be sentenced to death. Despite the jury's guilty verdict and sentence, many people believe that Cooper was wrongly convicted. And one of these people was Peggy Ryan's mother, Mary. She said that she had a very difficult time believing that just one person committed the murders. And listen, she's not saying, I don't think that she was saying it wasn't Kevin Cooper, but she's saying, I don't know if it was because it couldn't have just been him. It had right. to, it was yeah. multiple people. And in an interview that she did with 48 Hours, she said, I don't believe that my family just sat there all in a row waiting to be killed. And right. they would have had to do that with only one person because Absolutely. Peggy was screaming and the kids all ran into the room, into the parents' room because she was screaming. So now you've got all five of them in the same room mm -hmm. and you're only able to attack, presumably one at a time. Right. So if you've you're got one to person. Yeah, how one how person. is he switching between three weapons? You know? Yeah, I have I have absolutely no idea. I just don't know about that. But a private investigator, Paul Ingalls, had uh, who had once been a detective that was convinced of Cooper's guilt, agreed with Mary. Both Ingalls and Mary said that they just they don't just want Cooper to go free, they want the truth and they want to have it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And there are several points that have made people across the country question whether Cooper is actually guilty or if he was framed. One is, you know, like Mary pointed out, this didn't seem like a crime that could be committed by just one person. And even if you discount eight-year-old Josh's initial interview saying that he saw three men that night, police initially told the public that the crime was committed by more than one perpetrator, so they believed it too. And at least three weapons were used during the murders. In an interview, when asked how Cooper would have committed the crime with three different weapons, the prosecutor answered that Cooper was just ambidextrous. And, well, and we all know ambidextrous means that you have three hands. Eight is a lot of arms, isn't it, David? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, there's, so you got the two going, right? Where's the third? And none of the victims were ever verified as being bound, as being, you know. Right. It right. just doesn't make any sense, but all right. Prosecutors got answers, I guess. Mm -hmm. When Josh first saw the pictures of Cooper on the television while he was in the hospital, he told his grandmother twice that was not the man who murdered his family and his friend. The findings from the Ryan's stolen vehicle, um, another point. So the cigarette butts with Cooper's DNA were not found on the initial search of the car like we have talked about. Um, only on the second search. And Cooper believes that these butts were taken from the vacant house and put, moved to the vehicle upon the second search. Mm -hmm. Now, if we had started, if this was maybe the first case that we ever covered, I might have been like, no. Why would they do that? Why would they but do I've that? But I've seen Making a Murderer. Mm -hmm. I've seen The Innocence Files. Uh, exactly. We've seen how many, and scarily enough, not enough, but there have been criminologists and detectives that have been found guilty for planting evidence to get the answer the prosecutor wants of 
changing results, of hiding certain results, of, I mean, look at Dwayne Deaver in The Staircase. Now they've got to go back and look at every conviction that he ever got because he made, uh, it happens. And I also was thinking about, because, you know, in the beginning, I didn't think that, I'm like, what? Like you said, why would they do that? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Over what? Not being wrong? Look, when you have a little bit of power, the things that power does to people are insane. And our dad used to work for the city where we live. You should see the corruption in this small city office based on getting a little bit of power. And sir, if you're watching, you know who you are. Just everything was fine. And then one day he got a promotion and then bingo bongo, some weird shady shit's going on. Look at Ursula and the Little Mermaid. She was drunk with power. Totally. She wanted it bad. Totally. I mean, just saying. Power will do things to people and they will do. Power and greed. Yeah. And they will do anything that they can to keep it. Mm-hmm. And you got to think too. I mean, it's not, I agree with you 100%. But with the power for judges, prosecutors, whoever, DAs, whatever, um, comes money. If you can secure your spot mm-hmm. as the DA or as, I mean, you and know. And it's based like on closing cases and winning trials. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So if we are throwing all our eggs in this basket for whatever reason, possibly racially motivated, this guy escaped prison. He's black. We want to put him away because it's the murder of a white family and and friend. And we didn't find anything in the first search, but magically in the second search, everything that we need to tie him to the case is is there. But we all of us missed it in the first search. Mm-hmm. That's going to guarantee a conviction, isn't it? Absolutely. We didn't have that guarantee after the first search, but after the second search, we do. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. But also, like we have mentioned a little bit before in the vehicle there was blood found on three different car seats and that indicates that somebody was sitting in each of the seats with blood in them uh blood on them excuse me unless kevin cooper decided to play a little musical chairs by himself i didn't think about that of course you didn't think about that it's the only logical explanation (laughs) right maybe one of the seats had like a spring and he was like this isn't gonna work maybe it's you know Oh like yeah, this Goldilocks, seat's too you gotta try soft. This, one on. this seat's too yeah. hard. This one's just right. Yeah. Absolutely. If he's by himself, you would assume that he's sitting in the driver's seat. Unless Maybe. he's sitting in the other seats and using his go-go gadget arms to push the pedals and drive the... Well, he's ambidextrous, so... Thank... That's it. He's ambidextrous. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So he can drive a car from any seat in the car. Pretty incredible. Yeah, that's what that means. That's what that means. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And he can wield okay. three or more weapons with only two hands. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But that's not all about the car. No. The vehicle was ditched in Long Beach. So if Cooper was headed to Mexico, which has been confirmed that he was, yeah. it would Nobody be really, really weird. That. No. Even Cooper. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, he, yeah. But it would be so weird for him to drive the vehicle 50 miles out of the way and then yeah. head to Mexico. Because Mex- where he ended up in Mexico was what was it, 120 miles south of Chino Hills? Long Absolutely. Beach was yes, 50 yes, yes. miles west. He had to go way the fuck out of the way and then go. And he made it there by Why? the next day. Yeah. Or by the same day at this point. Because if we're, if we're thinking that they were attacked between 4 and 5 in the morning, he's got to do all of these things he's got to drive all the way to long beach and then get to tijuana i don't all right okay dan okay the evidence found inside of the ryan's house that linked cooper to the house was just a small drop of blood and cooper strongly believes that this blood was planted before the dna results were shared and upon his arrest two vials of cooper's blood were collected before the testing was performed the sample was signed out overnight by the same criminalist who eventually connected the blood to Cooper. Um, he has an explanation for that. Or she, I don't remember who the criminalist was. Um, this was simply to verify that there was enough blood left in the vial to test. And you often do that overnight before you do any testing. Absolutely. Well, you you want to be thorough. Sure. You really want to look at it sure. and the measuring and thing. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Inside of 10-year-old Jessica Ryan's hand was a clump of long blonde hair. And 
It looked more to me like brown hair, but it's... I was thinking dirty blonde. Yeah, dirty blonde at the most. It's not... Sandy blonde, maybe? It's not like this blonde. It's like... Mm -hmm. It's like this blonde. It that was, has some yeah, gray was, in it, but you know what I mean. Oh, quit. But, um, all right, it does. Okay, fine. But it's hair not. You, to. you look at Kevin Cooper's hair. He is a black man. It's not even consistent with. Like, not, not even, even kind of close. Not even it's kind not of the, te the texture with. is not the same. The because I know. I mean, you can you can have whatever kind of hair you have and be blonde. You could have red hair you could have blue hair you could have green hair you can have all kinds of things it's not the same it's not the same hair not one little bit no, no. and he had his hair braided and it was clutched <laughs> it's a in big her hand like she ripped it out of somebody's head fighting for her life also the crime scene itself was reportedly significantly contaminated the sheriff's department was said to have allowed more than 70 people to walk through the house now we're getting into a john benet ramsey situation so you and don't want to solve this murder Exactly. Within 48 hours. Well, now, hang on. They did solve it. Let's not say that they don't want to solve it. They solved it. Well, that's true. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's be real here. But um, within 48 hours of the murders, the district attorney ordered that the crime scene should be dismantled. The evidence was then stored in a warehouse that was not air conditioned and most of it was destroyed. Now you can say, oh, you did not want to solve the <laughs> murder. But they did. Yep. They, yeah. Let's talk about the motive. Uh, exactly. So Cooper, he's a convicted burglar. Like, th there's no disputing that. But there was cash still sitting on the Ryan's counter, and the keys to the station wagon were inside the vehicle. If he wanted to steal the car, he wouldn't have had to go inside the house. The The keys were no. inside the station wagon overnight. He could have just mm -hmm. taken the car if he wanted to. But, like like you said, they're they're saying the motive was he needed money, which we know he called some of his friends to ask for money. Mm -hmm. So why would he go inside this house and murder these people and then not take this, the cash that's sitting out? Right. It did not because it because it didn't happen. And then I'm he sorry. ditched. He would have ditched the station wagon 50 miles west before. How did he get another car? Did he murder somebody in Long Beach and take their car? He still yeah, got to think. Tijuana. What, what did he get to Tijuana in? We need to we should be able to figure that out and then figure out where the fuck he got that. The thing is, though, too, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like he, you would think, it took them a while to find the station wagon. It wasn't like they found it four hours later or something. He could, if, let's say it was him, let's say that this did happen, he could have made it all the way to Tijuana in that car, and no, then nobody would have found it. Exactly. Exactly. Why would, yeah, why would he ditch it in Long Beach? And there's also, like, guys, this is one of those cases that, like, there's a lot of information on, and we're, this is kind of an overview. There are multiple, multiple, multiple times that something is written down in the evidence log as having been totally consumed to test in the crime lab. They used all the sample, right? Nothing left of it to test. And then when they needed to perform a test to tie to Cooper because now they're asking for additional testing... Magically, magically that it. sample has come back and it's larger than it was before. Mm -hmm. It's larger than it was when they started. The vial of blood that they have on him, they accidentally sent the vial of blood with the shirt that they tested later to this criminalist who nor they sent the shirt and for whatever reason, somebody sent the vial. And so the criminalist tested both of them and the vial had two people's blood in it. This is a vial of blood that they drew from Kevin Cooper in law enforcement, drew from him when he was arrested. Yeah, this wasn't found at the scene. Why, why, is, why is there a mix, mixture of blood? The Judge Fletcher asserts that it's because somebody took some of the blood out to plant it on evidence. And then so that it didn't look like there was blood missing, they put somebody else's blood back in there to make the vial look regular. And all this sounds like crazy conspiracy stuff, but... The the well, 48 hours, she said... I was going to say. Yeah, go ahead. Well, are you talking about the... It was the shirt, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they... The police were saying, or the... Whoever was saying that they had only taken the shirt out when it was sent for testing. That nobody that was else had only ever time seen it. It had never been taken out of evidence. Handled or anything. Never, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. 48 hours got him on camera. Weeks before that, 
with this guy who was wearing gloves holding the shirt up to show. She had been taking questions about it. It's on camera. Yeah. And they're like, no, we've never taken this out. It's never been taken out of evidence. Nobody has ever handled it, touched it, seen it, anything. She's like, what about this? And the guy's like, that's it. No more questions. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. You're not telling the truth. uh Uh-huh outrageous and once you start lying like that it's hard to believe anything that you say honestly so you're telling me that everything else well okay maybe well they don't even admit that that was a lie but if they did I'm like well that was a lie but everything else is true really mm-hmm. i'm supposed to yeah I'm supposed to believe this? and his excuse was just well i didn't know about that and i can't tell you if it was true or not if i don't know about it she's like well i'm telling you about it right now he's like this is over uh, we're not talking about yep. this anymore i don't want to talk to coming to a screeching halt yeah, he was mad. Okay, so let's talk about <sighs> Cooper. Obviously, I mean, he's continuing to insist that he's innocent, and his argue uh, his attorney is arguing that the state didn't prove evidence or provide evidence of his guilt, and his appeals still continued to be denied. And in November, or no, in 1994, an attorney filed for a temporary stay of execution for Cooper's first ex- execution date of November 26, 1994. Throughout the next several years. Continued appeals are filed on Cooper's behalf, but they are denied one after the other. In 2001, a panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals denied Cooper's appeal yet again, but approved a post-conviction DNA testing to be performed. And the judge allowed partial testing with the involvement of the defense team. In 2003, the state announced that the DNA test results confirmed Cooper's guilt and a new date was set for his execution, which was February 10th, 2004. And this is with blood that was contaminated and yeah with just three hours and 42 minutes until cooper was going to be subjected to lethal injection the ninth circuit court of appeals issued a stay of of execution commanding the court to perform tests on the tan shirt found near the crime scene to see if the blood contained a preservative this would indicate that the blood was likely planted Mm -hmm. and that's the preservative edta which was a big thing in making a murderer um, mm-hmm. Because they believed that Stephen Avery's blood had been planted. Um, so, another point of contention is the witnesses. In 1984, a woman named Diana Roper came to police to tell them that she believed her ex-boyfriend was responsible for the Chino Hills murders. Her ex-boyfriend was ex-con Lee Furrow. Both Furrow and Roper were heavily involved in the in the white supremacy world, and Furrow had been jailed before for murder. Um, he had strangled a 17-year-old girl in 1974 at the request of gang leader Clarence Ray Allen. Furrow, and he dismembered her and threw her body parts into a river. Um, yeah. But he testified against Allen and he got a four-year sentence. For murder and dismemberment. Of a 17-year-old. This is when I believe and say, fuck a plea deal. 100%. Uh, Roper first met Burrow in prison when she was visiting another inmate. That's uh, one hell of a way to meet your f-ing boyfriend. It's a meet cute. That's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. At the time of the murders, Burrow was on parole. He was living with Diana. She said that Furrow's life consisted of sex, drugs, and uncontrolled rage. She told police that on the morning of June 5th, 1983, a car pulled into her driveway and Furrow walked inside. Um, He was also with a woman who he'd been having an affair with. Um, That ended up, wasn't it her friend? I don't remember if they were friends or not. Because her friend was there at the time too. And then he and this woman, Debbie, I think her name was, came in together. Well, I'm just wondering because the police later go on to be like, oh, don't listen to her. She's just mad because he took off with her friend. Mm, maybe. Yeah. And you do. Ha- I mean, you do have to watch about that kind of stuff. Well, my ex did this, you know, like I get that. You need to investigate it for sure. You can't just take somebody's word. Um, But the keyword being ag- investigate it. Exactly. Um, so this car pulls into her driveway. Furrow comes inside. At the time, he was wearing dark coveralls, and he went into the closet, he took them off, he changed his clothes, and then he left. And he left them there in the closet on the floor. A few days later, Roper picked up the coveralls to find that they were completely covered in blood. She also said that when he'd left the house before that day, he'd been wearing a tan t-shirt, just like the one that was found. 
And she had bought him that t-shirt from Kmart, she said. So she's like, I recognize the shirt. I bought it for him. He was wearing it that day. Um, Roper also said that Furrow kept lots of tools out on the back porch hanging on nails and that his hatchet was missing. In her affidavit to police, Roper said, quote, the coveralls were splattered with blood and there was horse hair and dried horse sweat on the lower leg area. How do you know that? I don't know. I'm, I, the only thing that I can figure out is maybe the smell. I don't know. Uh, he did not have the beige t-shirt or Levi's on that he was wearing earlier that day. Lee walked to the back of the house and seemed to be in a hurry. Lee took the coveralls off and left them on the floor in the closet. After he changed his clothes, Lee left immediately. She also said that a few days later, Furrow cut his hair short and trimmed his sideburns and mustache. She gave the police these coveralls. And they tested them for DNA. Because mm -hmm. that's what you do in a case like this. Um, that's really cute that you think that that's what happened. She gave the coveralls for sure. She did. 100% gave them to him. Yeah. Well, what did they do with the with the coveralls? They threw them in the dumpster. Why? They threw them right in the garbage. Um, because they didn't believe her. She had a history of drug use. Um, she did say to the police that she had been using drugs the day of this. And, like, what she told them was she and a group of friends, including Lee, went to some uh, concert together, festival or something. They were all there. She leaves with her friend. Lee stays with this Debbie woman. I'm pretty sure her name was Debbie. That he'd been sleeping with, apparently, as well. And it seemed like Diana knew about this because she says Debbie and Lee come inside the house. They come in the house. Lee changes. He leaves. Debbie leaves with them. But they said there was a car parked in the driveway at the time. They showed up in a car. Debbie and Lee leave on his motorcycle and the car also drives away. So there's two separate mm -hmm. vehicles at this point. Her right. friend that was there said that it looked like a station wagon. She couldn't be sure. Um, but she was also really afraid of Debbie because Debbie was heavily involved, supposedly, in, in this gang activity. And she was scared of her, so she didn't want to testify against her or anything like that. Um... So they just said, well, she is a drug user. You can't trust a damn word. She says she's mad at her ex-boyfriend because he left her for another woman. Mm -hmm. End of story. Another witness who has not been named due to her being fearful for her life said that there was a vehicle that almost crashed into her the day after the murders. She recalled seeing three adult white males inside, one with dirty blonde hair or light brown hair. She wrote down the license plate number, and when she heard about the murders in the missing car, she found that it was the same license plate number. She reportedly wrote to police with this information, but they never followed up with her. Long after the trial, two women came forward and said that on the night of the murders, they saw, quote, three disorderly white patrons at a bar not far from the Ryan home called the Canyon Corral Bar. And they said that one of the men was wearing coveralls, and they were covered in blood and she said at first from far away it just looked like they were dirty maybe had grease spots on them or something and it was dark in there but when they got closer to him so apparently he was hitting on a woman that she was with um in an aggressive sort of manner and they did not want this attention from these men um so when they got closer to them she was like no it was definitely blood and he was just like, oh, um, I had a, a nosebleed. So if we, this corroborates Diana's story. Yeah, it does. And didn't, in the 48 hours, didn't they say that like the bar owner or the bouncer or somebody also said that there were three guys there that were pretty unruly or. I thought that somebody else was, says they yeah. saw what these two women saw. Yeah. At this time, Kevin Cooper is still in prison. He is on San Quentin's death row. In 2021, the governor of California issued an executive order to launch an independent investigation of Cooper's case and further DNA testing. Politicians, religious figures, even celebrities have publicly voiced their support for further investigation into the conviction, including the Pope and Kim Kardashian. It's an all-star cast here.
I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to say how I feel about any of that. Mary, Peggy's mother, um, unfortunately passed away, still with lingering questions about the conviction of Kevin Cooper. Josh Ryan has made his peace with Cooper being the person who killed his family. There are a lot of people who feel strongly that Cooper was the person behind the Ryan Hughes murders. Um, and there are just so many places that you can find information about this. Other podcasts have covered it. I'm sure there's tons of YouTubers that have covered it. Um, 48 Redditors, Hours, yeah, did a ton, of- a, a few different shows on it. They've covered it over the years. Um, there's a lot of court documents available, like the 141 page document I reviewed. Um, there's a lot out there. So it's it's a rabbit hole kind of case for sure. We're certainly not sitting here saying that he never did anything wrong and he doesn't deserve to be in prison anyway. That's not what we're saying. Um, and we're also not saying that he for sure didn't take part in this. But this is a botched investigation. Like, I feel like botched is a kind word. For it is. Here. Here's the thing. If you don't do your job as an investigator, two things happen. Wrongful convictions and murderers walk free. You have to do your job correctly so that those two things don't happen. Absolutely. And if he gets out on a technicality and he is the person that actually convicted or murdered these people, that's on you for your investigation. If you did it right the first time, there wouldn't be questions. Like, mm-hmm. you have to do it right. Absolutely. There's no excuse for what this ended up being. Absolutely no excuse. No. And it's like blatant disregard for wanting to solve anything is what it feels like. Because well, how else can you yeah. take it? I mean... I think that they got it in their minds. This is who we've decided is going to take the fall for this, whether it's justified or not. Mm-hmm. And fuck everything else. Yeah. And who suffers? The families of the people who have been murdered, their loved ones, the people who... Josh Ryan, you know? Yeah. And possibly, if we're looking at another victim of justice, if Kevin Cooper is innocent, then he, him, because he's mm-hmm. spent more than half of his life behind bars. On death row. Mm -hmm. And his family, his, you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's just just baloney is what it is. Yeah, absolutely. It sure is. So that's what we've got on this case. Uh, You guys can definitely let us know what you think. If you're listening, thanks for listening. If you're watching it on the YouTubes, thanks for watching. Yes, thank you so much. We love you. Bye. Bye.